Jeopardies. Um, and Luis Garcia has just scored. No, she hasn't. I'm getting it mixed up. It, uh, you know what? I'm trying to work out who it is here. But one of the ladies have just scored, uh, you know, in the um, 91st minute. So, guys, let me just start again. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Harami United. Um, you know, as we know, it's a podcast about Manchester United, all things Manchester United, whether that's the men's, women, youth team. Um, and sorry, it is Williams who's just scored. Uh, so, yeah, you can hear we, we, we're talking live. We're watching the game as well. Boys, I don't know. Have you, have you been watching the game? Um, Villa v Manchester United? I had it on for about 10 minutes and I had to do some well, I've been busy. It, I've literally it, just sat it, down now. Is it 2-1 now? Is it 2-1 now? Isn't it's 2-1. It? Yeah. yeah. Um, Lucy Stanifor got sent off. Then um, Rachel Daly scored, made it 1-0 to Villa. And then we equalised. And now we've just scored um, what looks hopefully to be the winner. We've got about uh, five minutes left to play. So, guys, you know this is raw. This is real. So, um, sorry about the introduction. It's not Next time I'll tell you what I press record, yeah? Yeah, how we started, exactly. Um, but look, boys, I make no bones, no apologies um, about this. Uh, you know, um, the men's side are just giving me so much heartache. I mean, this uh, is the passion as fans, though, isn't it? That's the thing. It's the passion that we've got about United. Now we've got the women's team as well. We're going to watch them. Um, we're going to support all, every level of teams. Do you know what I mean? That's the thing. This is just being, us fans, being passionate about the club that we love. Exactly. Like, you know what I mean? And uh, and to watch the ladies play is so refreshing as well. Just like, you know, let's talk, you know, the, the game, you know, yesterday's Palace game. And what were they, what were, you know, I don't want to get into too much because I think everybody's rinsed it and repeated it. We've done it, yeah. But I think the things that's been accused of the players, certain players, Rashford, Bruno, and other, there's just lack of passion. There's not enough running. Um, you know, the heads are down. Whereas when you're watching the ladies, you know, we're getting all that. We're getting the passion. We're getting the running. Um, you know, we've got quality, quality as well. Um, you know, just seeing uh, Jay Z played um, earlier as well. Wow, what a signing! You know, we talk about hounding a player down and running and, and quality. Well, she encapsulates all that. Um, you know, it's something to look forward to. It's like, like said. two different mentalities, isn't it? The women's and men's at the moment. It's like it's like the women's team has already got new owners, but the men's team yeah. haven't. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's just different. This 100%. is what I was just going to question. Like, you look at the women's team and. You know, props to them. They're doing their thing. They're going about business. They're, you know, picking up points. But look at the men's team and it's completely different. And I hate to do this, but those women are paid fractions of what the men are paid. And it's the standard is completely like the women are carrying the flag right now, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Um, the, 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 yeah, the ladies team, we've got a lot to be proud of. Um, you know, there's lots of things um, that's going for them. You know, we've got some World Cup winners in there as well. World Cup finalists, European winners. Um, you know, we've got some players from the youth system, um, young players. Like I said, the, the women's team just seems to be encapsulating everything that, that the Manchester United team as a, as a whole should stand for. And, you know, we, we're accusing the men's side of lacking that. It could be for many reasons. It could be because of the pressure. You know, the 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 eyes on the men's team is completely different. Um, I, I haven't got the answer to to the question. You know, why why does it look so different? But it definitely does. But yeah, look, um, I'll keep you up to date. Like I said, there's about a minute and a half left of the ladies' game, so hopefully we'll win that. So it'll be a great start to the season. But boys, like I said, I don't want to talk too much about it. But yesterday's game. <sighs> Can we put our finger on why it was different compared to Tuesday as we played the same team? I mean, I think he's changed the teams, um, the lineup basically. For me, he should have kept on Hannibal. Um, again, I think if you, people have said it on Twitter as well, and people have said it basically before Casemiro, Mount, and Bruno can't play together. And, I, and slowly, slowly, I'm starting to believe that. I think Hannibal would have been different. Um, in that team. But then with that one though, Aki, the only player then that came in compared to Tuesday is Bruno. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I was, I was going to say, and Bruno has been instrumental since he has signed for United. And this is the thing, it's, it's, it, 
it is it unbalanced? It, it like I've got no words for it. How we can fit him in with the Mount signing with Casemiro with Ericsson, um with Hannibal. I don't know how he's gonna get the best out of him, but it's just like we've spent fifty five million on Mount and we've given him the number seven shirt. If he, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying he's gonna flop. I want him to succeed, but it's like that's another. No, no, number seven. But then, actually, Fairly. don't forget, if we're going to say Tuesday was our, probably our best game, then, you know, Mount was part of that, even in the first half where a lot of the, the good play did come from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, he he was, I would say, he was the player of that half. Obviously, yeah. he, he took, yeah, yeah. took in off the second half. Uh, so then we, you know, if we're going to compare it, then we're going to say Bruno was a problem. But then Bruno has been our best player signing post Ferguson. And, yeah. and you know, I think every eye test tells you that the the stats tells you that. Um, I mean, I, I mean, the, the the way I see it, like I watch what it is. Just even after yesterday, this morning I watched both games highlights. Wow, I'm fair play to you, man. Because I wanted to see the difference. I, I mm. wanted to see the difference. You know what I mean? And I've been awake since like five, six in the morning, and I've just been doing stuff, and I've just watched both both games back to back, and I just wanted to see the difference. The difference was for me in the first game. Uh, midweek, Amrabat basically bought the best out of Casemiro and Mount. In this one, I don't know, it was just we, we couldn't even get Amrabat to get the best out of all these. Lot. Like, Amrabat tried to come in the middle and everything to push everyone out, but it, it wasn't even working. And I think it's that it is it, it's the middle of the park that we need to try to control. But the, well, the crazy thing is, it's what well, I think was, I only read it or I heard it somewhere and say that like, we had 70 plus percent possession. Yeah. You know, uh, and it wasn't like we got battered by on the goal chances or, or anything like that. Um, you, you know what it is, Hobbs? Even if you push out Bruno or Mount on the right side, on the right wing, it's still the same thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I don't. I don't... I'll be honest with you. I I can't work. I can't work it out. I, I'm not. I, I'm not paid, and I'm not in in the dressing room or on the or on the. Um, sorry, just to let you know, guys, the ladies have one. So, a great start for the ladies team. United ladies team two one. So, like I said, um, really happy with that. Uh, lifts the, uh, the mood from yesterday a little bit. Um, but yeah, so going back to the men's game, um, you know, I for one cannot believe Eric Ten Hag wants our team to lose. He obviously wants to win. You know. He could see what he saw on Tuesday. He knew, you know, like all us fans, you know, you don't change a winning team. Now, there must have been a reason why he changed it. But not only that, not only did he change it, but he completely didn't bring on Hannibal, who was one of our best players. Now, to me, I like to think I'm logic and I'm a bit sane. But to me, then that's saying to me, well, OK, he's a young lad, 19, 20. He's played the last two, three games, two and a half games in a row. We know he's high energy. He's very high energy. Obviously, he came off the game on Tuesday as well. Is is there a niggling injury that he didn't want to risk? Because, you know, he, he spoke glowing terms about um, Hannibal as well, Eric Ten Hag did. He kind of basically said that's what – he is the template of what we need. If you listen to him – He, he, he even conference. scored against – he even scored against Brian when he came on as well. Yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and this is why then I'm thinking – and he didn't even bring him on. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. and this is to me. I'm then thinking he's spoken about him. He knows that's what we need, but can he? There's a reason why he's not used him. You know, even Johnny Evans. He, Johnny Evans didn't play, but we Johnny Evans. We know he's not 35. He can't play that many games in a row. Do you know what I mean? And it's just, it's to me, it's almost like he knows what he wants to do. He can't do it for whatever reason. Um, you know, I. I you know, I've, I've backed Rashford. Uh, you know, I've backed Bruno as well. But I think, I think, just for the sake of his own, how can I put it? From fans, you should never go into fans' pressure because, like I said, you don't know what's happening behind the scenes. You don't know, um, you know, how the players are training or what injuries they've got. You know, we definitely don't want to play somebody like Hannibal if he's got a strain or, or some kind of injury. Just for the sake of the fans playing him, and then he gets injured for another, you know, a month or two, like all the other 
players seem to be doing so far. So to me, it's it's a reason. But I almost want him to drop Rashford, and I, and I want him to drop Bruno as well. And let's just see. Look, if we win, brilliant. But then if we lose, he can turn around and say, well, hang on, you all wanted Bruno out, you all wanted Rashford out, and we've lost. Do you know what I mean? It, it might put it to bed. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. Is there a way forward or, or what we should do? You know what? To me, it just seems like in one window, we solved the defensive issue and we have a season that we had last year where we had the clean sheets, the golden glove. We had a great defence, but the problem was the middle of the park and up front. So then we go out and buy some midfielders. We go out and buy a striker. And then all of a sudden, we've got, even though we've strengthened in them positions, we somehow seem to have gone backwards, which I don't know what's going on at the club. I don't know if that's the manager. I don't know if that's the player as like, you know, I'm not in the dressing room. I can't say for sure. You know, of course, it could be a training thing. It could be anything, but it just seems like every time we take a step forward, we take 10 back. Like, yeah. It's so positive and you know we were glowing on the back of that cup win yeah it's a league cup yeah it's not the biggest trophy in the world but look you can only beat what's put in front of you and we did that and we did that very well yeah and this is what i'm saying it's, it's just it just seemed like che- chalk and cheese as they say like jumping between the two performances um and another thing you come to a point that like i've said again um you know having to repeat myself i just just think there's things behind the scenes that we just not prove it to as fans and and you know i think we take for granted that you know only what we see is on the pitch is only the thing that happened you know things happen off the there pitch must be something see. there must be something because i think today just recently um someone came out from i think disc or something mm-hmm. um the article he 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 basically said there's a quote saying that Ten Hag's questioning something to do with the uh, behaviour or something like that of the players. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't get it bang on, but it was something along those lines. And I don't know, it's, it's, there is something going on behind the scenes. Who knows what it is? Um, but it's, it's, it's affecting the team, the players, uh, probably the manager, the backroom staff, the training methods maybe. Um because when we was on pre-season, it was it was different. It was like a different vibe, wasn't it? And now it's just like yeah, and, the, it really low. and that's the thing. It's just like if Eric Ten Hag hadn't done what he done last season, we could we all said he's a progressive manager, which he was. He had a good pre-season. Uh, okay, we had a bit of a shit start, but we knew why that was, and then we, we kicked on from there. But we had a great. I'm gonna say we had a great season because we we exceeded ex- expectations by all all accounts. Uh, after the the final cup final win, you know we kind of did, did drop off, but look, we got into top four, finished third, you know, and then and then things that turned the way the opposite almost this year. Do you know what I mean? So it's almost like well, we've seen Ten Hag is able to do it and he's done it, but there's just now something's happened that we just can't put our fingers on what on what's happened. You know, a lot of people are like blaming the preseason, how much more did you have to do? So maybe he didn't train the players as much, thinking I'm going to knacker them out. And look at all the injuries we've got, and we seem to be getting as well. Do you know what I mean? But um, yeah, and like I says, um, I think in danger of just keep repeating ourselves. I think, you know, I think one thing we are, is clear to me is the club is almost on its knees. I mean, barring you know a relegation, I just think you know it, it's just it's just I just don't see how we're going to get forward. I mean, just to touch on that as well, the, the club's on his knees, the, the stadium's on his knees as well. I think there was a video from a guy called, was it Kyle Afsal? Uh, one second, I will find I it I think now. Kyle, he beat someone posted it up with the roof leaking. And then um, from what, yesterday's game? Oh, yes, yeah. I think I said it. Yeah, 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 sorry. He was just sitting there, then, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just today, Lewis, um, he's a designer on Twitter as well. He's literally also... Um, to quote to it, it's saying that I was on the opposite side of the pit, of opposite of the stadium, and I think he was in the Stratford end then. Yeah, so, and he goes the same thing. Um, the, the roof was leaking. And you know what, boys? 
you know, it, 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 it's 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 reminding me, and I, I just want to move the topic on now from from that there. Um, I mean, a, a bit of a history lesson here for for all those listeners who may not be aware of this here. Um, but yeah, um, many 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 years ago, a couple of centuries ago, um, in in Manchester United's deep history, we we were facing you know when we were called Newton Heath, uh, we were facing you know similar kind of issues. You know, obviously not as severe as you know we're not. We're not going through them as severe as they are, you know, back then, today. We're not facing that kind of thing. But it almost brings parallels to me. And there was a, you know, and I just want to kind of bring this in and, you know, where I see these parallels. There's a gentleman called John Henry Davis. Um, you know, he was a wealthy brewery owner from Manchester. And, you know, he played a crucial role in saving Manchester United from bankruptcy back in 1902. Um, like I said, Back then, the club was known as Newton Heath and they were in serious financial trouble and needed to raise what was back then a thousand pounds to avoid bankruptcy. Um, you know, as we know today, we are going through some financial troubles. Um, you know, the, the, you know, with we could see the way we in, in the transfer market, the lack of well, you know, investment into the infrastructure, the you know, debt we have as a, as a club. Um, but then Davis, along with four of the local businessmen, they invested in the club and took over its debts, which were of two thousand six hundred and seventy pounds, uh, as as of what I've what I've been able to research. And can you boys? Can you can you see the kind of parallels of what was happening back then to to what's happening now? Yeah, it's it's similar in a lot of ways because you've got. This British billionaire who came in, um, and the club was in debt. It was basically just going down. It, it, even now, the Glazers, even though they're American, you've got the Glazers literally financially messed up United itself. They've got nothing. I think someone said a few days ago that they cut, they're literally going by a monthly basis kind of thing, and it. Every department's on embargo and stuff like that. Um, and I think obviously, yeah, you are right. It is parallel. It does basically just show that. And sorry, just and just here, like it says, the under Davis's leadership, what happened? The club's name was changed to Manchester United Football Club, and they changed the colours to red shirts and white shorts you know from um you know the yellow and green that was that we saw under newton heath and davis also arranged for john j bentley to be appointed as the club's first full-time secretary manager and then what happened was davis invested heavily into the club funding the construction of a new stadium at old trafford in 1910 and loaning the club sixty thousand pounds to build a hundred thousand capacity stadium uh, you know, which was have to, you know, was to have a, a gymnasium, bars, lift, and restaurants. You know, it, like I said, the crazy thing is, we, we we're at that point again now. You know, okay, we don't need to change the name of, of the club. We don't need to change the cl- colours. But my God, do we need some investment in, in into Old Trafford and you know the stadium it's like and it's the running areas. a cycle. It's crazy, isn't it? The parallels. No, you, know. you just sort of the way you think about it. There, obviously, you wanted to build this at the time. What would have been revolutionary, state of the art stadium? Yeah, gymnasium, bars, lifts. Like you know, back in nineteen ten, that was. Look at what you know. We need that now. We need that That's equivalent now, don't we? The, like the yeah, state that's of the art. What I mean. Like, it's just mental. And I know me and you, you know, we look at sort of the NFL stadiums in America and stuff, and you see how much money the Americans have put in. Obviously, the NFL system is a bit different. The way it works is it sort of comes from taxpayers' money. But look at what they build. Look at what Tottenham built. Look at what Real Madrid have just done. Barcelona, even with all their debts. (laughs) You know the funny thing is, well, the funny thing is, 
you know, the funny thing is, yeah, I'm just reading this up now as well, and it says names such as Manchester Celtic, Manchester Central, was was suggested, but an Italian immigrant named Louis Rocker came up with the name Manchester United Football Club. So, so he was, so he was an, an Italian. Yeah, an t- Italian immigrant named Louis Rocca came up with a name Manchester United Football Club. So already back, even engraved in the club's history, yeah. it's a multicultural um, club. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's so it's not just the the born and bred British in Manchester, whatever have you, like you said, an Italian in, immigrant. I mean, I, I do want to kind of discuss this a little bit, but just just I just kind of finally want to say. So, you know, when John Henry Davis took over 1902, Manchester United won the league in 1908 and the FA Cup in 1909. They won the league in 1908 and the FA Cup in 1909 under Davis's ownership. But overall, John Henry Davis played a crucial role in the history of Manchester United's ownership. Like I said, transforming the club from a struggling team on the brink of bankruptcy to one of the most successful football clubs in England. No, like I says, that's what we need today. You know, we need the John Henry Davis of today to come and almost save this, save this club. Um, you know, like I said, nineteen oh two, he took over, and then nineteen oh eight, they won the the league. You know, so that's about six years. You know, different. So you know, we're not saying a new owner comes in and. Straight away, we start winning things, and oh, the, the atmosphere is going to be. Oh gosh, I should say the the football is going to be so great. You know, we're just going to sweep all in front of us. But we need that start, don't we? Now, we've got two potential players. You know, looking to buy Manchester United. Which ones do we think? You know, forget all hats. Forget you know our buy. Well, some people call them biases, and I, I don't think we are. But we always try and play it logically. You know. In terms of Sir Jim Ratcliffe, if we start with him, what what do you believe he would bring to the club if we're going to kind of compare it to what John Henry Davis did? You know, Sir Sir Jim Ratcliffe, I do believe he would bring stability to the club itself. Um, He would bring success to the club. But it's how long does it last and how long does it take for it to happen? I mean, like obviously the you've got uh, Davis, who's basically just bought the club with investors, uh, took the took the debt out and everything, um, changed the club name and everything. You you got Sergeant Ratcliffe who wants to bring the Manchester back into Manchester, which is fair enough. Maybe obviously Manchester United have lost the whole identity of being in Manchester. Maybe what he's referring to is saying. Manchester City have taken over and we need Manchester United back into um, back on top. Maybe that's what he's referring to. Um, I think Sergeant Ratcliffe would end up being successful like, as United owner, but the question remains for me is how long and how long does it take for him to be successful? Yeah, and uh, so we're going off, so sorry. Yeah, all I was just going to say regarding, obviously, Sir Jim Ratcliffe and Ineos and, you know, look, they didn't get to where they are in the world by being stupid or making moves that don't, you know, you get to that level by doing things the right way. You don't get to that level of wealth just by coasting through life. But my sort of reserve with all that is what is his model exactly is it sustainable because everyone says that oh yeah man united um don't need investment they just you know they're self-sustainable this that the other well i'm sorry but have you seen what's happening because clearly we do need investment clearly we do need someone to come in essentially put you know, 50p in the meter and get us going again. Yeah, this is the thing. Is it, The question remains, how, it's how much time does he have to put in that investment? How long is it going to take for the stadium to be rebuilt or to develop? How long is it going to take for the equipment of the training ground to be done up? Um, it's these little investments. That, well, they're not little investments. 
the massive, huge investment, ain't they? Yeah, so, I think what I think financially, like you're saying. So you know, from what we hear, and I think he, he probably is correct because he he does it in other areas as well. He's going to get debt to to buy the club to begin with. Uh, and look, debt's fine. Um, if it's manageable, serviceable, and I, from what I believe, people are saying, you know, it would be Ineos's debt. Okay, that's fine. Um, you know, we, but obviously they've had some recent um, financials come out which haven't been positive for them. But look, doesn't mean that they could have potentially buy the club. But, you know, once they've bought the club on debt, what we're then saying is that, right, we've still got to build or refurbish Manchester United. Now, I think the owners currently have already had kind of quotes done of refurb and the potential of new build. So I think refurb was around about over a billion and a, and a new stadium would cost up to two billion, probably a bit more now since they've done that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So not only are you buying the club on, on um, probably loans, but now you've got to find another two billion or so to invest just in for the infrastructure of that, uh, you know, was maintaining the current debt and there are other you know there are other entities within Ineos as well because obviously they've got Lausanne the Swiss club they've got OGC Nice they've got their cycling team you know I think there's a lot that goes on in that portfolio that then they'd have to worry about you know how much time would they have for Manchester United on top See, of that's the ones... one of my worries in that we know that their portfolio is huge so no I'm going to compare this to Abu Dhabi, for example. Abu Dhabi bought Man City. They made Man City the focal point of what is now known as the City Football Group, right? They bought all these other little clubs around them and set up this network, and however they did it, they did it. Whereas right now, obviously, he's got other clubs. He's got investments in other clubs. Uh, while we're on that subject, shout out and best wishes to Alexis Becker Becker. Obviously, a horrible situation the other day. Thankfully, he was talked down. Hope all is well. Hope he gets the help he needs. But back onto the subject is he's got all these other clubs. Obviously, Man United would be the crown in that drool. But is he then going to say to the other clubs, sorry, mate, I'm knocking you down the pecking order because I've got to focus on them. Like, what's the knock-on effect going to be in that sense? Yeah, but I suppose people will turn around and say, "Look, he's got some experience um, in 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 sporting ventures. You know, he's got two clubs, football clubs. He's got a cycling team. He, you know, invests into the Mercedes AMG team as well, F1 team. Um, you know, irrespective of of how they're getting on, you know, those kind of investments, he's got some kind of experience in, in the sporting side of things. Um, but yeah, you know, would would he be able to commit those funds that I need? Because the other thing for me is as well, is is the clubs around us. Obviously, City will keep churning in. Obviously, um, Chelsea keep spending crazily, you know, but they're, they're spending heavily. Uh, you know, obviously, we all know about Newcastle as well. So compared to when John Henry Davis came in in 1902, again, I'm not too sure what, what the makeup of all the other clubs around them were. But we're, we're, at this moment in time, so far behind not only the English clubs, but obviously the other European clubs as well, that I think the stadium would be one of the first things that we would need investment on. You know, so bringing it back, so the other person that we're looking at is, um, you know, looking to buy the club is Shay Jassim. Now your thoughts, again, boys, you know, we've, we've spoken about Shay Jassim here plenty of time, but let's, let's try and keep it objective as well. What 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 would it be about Sheikh Jassim that would you know we, if we compare it to John Henry Davis' time, would we say would happen what he did then? What could Sheikh Jassim do today? I think it, I think it's the same thing as what I think everyone wants him to do anyway. As as a United fan, as a fan, you want the new one to come in, invest in the team, the stadium, the training ground, and everything. Uh, even the community itself, um, I don't believe he's going to obviously change the club name or the or the badge of the colours. I think he's he's going to keep everything the same because I think I've heard a few things saying that it's the devil and whatever and it's the Middle East. And I think obviously Sheikh Jasmine is going to keep everything the same how it is. But 
with Sheikh Jassim is what makes it similar to Davis is the fact that he'll clear the debt. Eventually, we will know um, he's going to invest in the club in all, in all areas and he will probably end up putting the club back on top. And I think for me, the biggest thing is, was when he said, every penny that the club makes goes back into the 94 Foundation. It's like I'm. It's like him saying, I'm not taking no dividends out. And I do believe, obviously, Sergeant, Sergeant Ratcliffe will end up taking dividends out eventually. Um, plus, obviously, he's, he's got the loan to pay off that he's basically borrowed, borrowed as well. Yeah, because to service the debt or the loans that he's taken to buy the club, yeah. he needs to pay them somehow. You know, I think fans are, you know, who talk about Sir Jim Ratcliffe, who pro Sir Jim Ratcliffe, kind of maybe lose that point that they think Ineos as a group earned so much money that they could afford to do that. But then the reason why they bring Manchester United into that portfolio, so they're one of another source that contributes to that there so you know the revenues alone from manchester united you know can pay the debt off eventually um but then that would then come at a detriment of not having any investment on the field or, or the playing staff which will then have even more detriment on on the stadium and the infrastructure and things like that because you know you can't have all the ineos groups profits going into manchester united because they have obviously yes there are shareholders you know they're the shareholders, the one who buy the club, but they can't just focus on Manchester United. You know, there's other things that they're the part of the organisation they've got to think about as well. But also, you know, in terms of, I think, like Aki says, you know, Shea Jesse uh, and, and his investment. But even, like, why, why do you believe in terms of the, just the stadium itself, why do you believe in these, that that's one of the crucial things to invest in? I mean, I'll answer that question, but I'm just going to throw it back to the Sir, the Sir Jim and the Ineos aspect for one second, because you mentioned shareholders. And look, we've been there with shareholders. We've done it before. These kind of institutions want a return on investment. They want dividends that, you know, they want their piece of the pie, essentially. And, you know, rightfully so which, you know, I've got no problem with. But I just think as Manchester United, we have we have seen that. We have seen what it's done to our club. Um, and I just, it just leaves a bit of an uneasy feeling with me. But just bringing it onto the stadium now. Look, as Kyle said in that tweet, or oh, well, showed rather, it's got holes all over the show. I see people say to me, uh, match-going fans that say to me, oh, it's not as bad as everyone makes out. And I'm like, I've not been to a game for quite a few years, but I know how bad that ground is. You know what I mean? Are you telling me someone's photoshopping and editing water piling through? Like, it's a mess. The You know, not even a lick of paint. They gave it a lick of paint and they, they missed a spot where I think the cladding goes underneath the brickwork and they kind of just left that and you could see on the picture that one side of it was brand new fresh coat of paint and the other side was all faded and weathered and it had aged basically, right? So, I don't know, I just think the stadium... The stadium's where you play every single, well, every single one of your home games. That's where your fans come to watch you play. That's where the journalists come. Look, they're your, they're your paying customers. Like, look after them. No one wants to be going to a game and coming home drenched when, even though there was a roof over their head. Like, I just think from that aspect, you need, you know, you need to look after the fans a little bit as well. Not just, oh, we've got a brand new fancy stadium. Make it more accessible. You know, one thing I wanted to point out as well was, you know, th this debt that we're talking about, this debt, not the Sir Jim Ratcliffe debt that he's going to obviously, not the debt, but the loan that he's taken out, 
is the John, John Henry Davis, when he bought United in 1902, the debt on the club was, what, 2,670, wasn't it, pounds? So That's great, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was in 1902. Now, just imagine that much, how much that would be in 2023 compared to what it was... I can tell you how much. <laughs> Go on. Sorry. No, I put that figure into the Bank <laughs> of England inflation calculator before. Now, anything sort of pre-1988 is an estimate. It does say this on the website. Mm. But so £2,670 in 1902 as of August 2023, because it wouldn't let me select any other month, is currently £269,000. Seven hundred and ninety-five pound eighty-five pence, which is still an awful lot of money. Yeah, it it would be a lot of money even now. But obviously, if you look at what the the debt is on the the club right now, it's what seven hundred million or something. What eight hundred? It's a lot. Well, rising interest rates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's well, then you have to also look at the. Say that again, Naki. How much was it? Did you say? Sorry. Which so, bit? The what, which one? What would did you say? How much would be equivalent to today? Yeah. Okay, so the equivalent of it today, again, anything pre nineteen eighty eight is an estimate, but Bank of England website has got it at two hundred and sixty nine thousand. Seven hundred and ninety. Just round it up in it. Round, round it up. Just round it up. Call it two hundred seventy grand. Yeah, two hundred seventy grand. Yeah. It's a lot Which of money, though. Like, it's a lot back, of money. But back yeah. then. But yeah, but what you think is the club itself? The debt on the club now is a lot of it. It'd be in the millions. Do you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's... Well, we were about millions? six, seven hundred million. Yeah, well, yeah. including all the transfer fees and things like that, it's, 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 it's over a billion. Nearly a billion, yeah, nearly a billion. Yeah. Yeah. Nearly a billion. You've got the transfer fees and everything like that. It's, it's over a billion. I'm surprised we've not got to the stage where we we can't even pay wages. I'm surprised. Well, we we we. The thing is, we we. You know, we make so much money. We turn over so much money. And the one good thing that the club has done, um, I think with all the high earners that left, the likes of Ronaldo, Pogba and all them big people, you know, I think they've got it around just under 51% of turnover is their, their their wages for the staff and things like that. So you know, that, that, that's a great thing. Um but like I said, like you said, Aki, the, there was an Italian um, immigrant who kind of is is part of the reason why we call Manchester United Manchester United today? You know, the uh, Manchester Celtics. I remember you saying there, and uh, Manchester Falcons. I think you said as well. Um, but you know, it's United, and that and now that's that, that plays so much because it's United. So we've got, you know, it all for all for um, Sir Jim Ratcliffe bringing Manchester back into Manchester. You know, after Salah went you know did brexit and went off to monaco you know you know um but you know we've got say somebody from a, a, another background like shay Jassim, a manchester united fan you know where's the devil on his shirt um the manchester united top what and as we know <laughs> the funny thing is i was watching east is east is only um two three days ago um with the kids um and again the, the a pop- sick movie man sick movie that it's exactly, you know, George, yeah. George and Ella. Uh, as soon as he said Ella, I thought Ella Chu, uh, obviously a great player. You know, um, again, if you've not watched East of East, please do. It is, uh, I think it is a, it's a true life story with obviously it's a bit, um, a spin put on there. Salford background, yeah. Salford, the Salford where they are. Bra- yeah. yeah, Salford where they are, you know, Manchester United and things like that, obviously around. Um, do you remember that clip of, uh, I think is Ryan Giggs running in alleyways? Yes, yes, yes. It was one of those alleyways as well. Oh, where each is easy shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. But this is what I mean. In Manchester is such a diverse community, and it's a worldwide community. You know, the name a guy who's responsible for the name United at the end of the Manchester United is an Italian immigrant. So, I think it's so Louis Rocker. 
Ruth Ruffy is the idea. So why I, not? It's I'm just like, and, and, and bring that because I think we do this podcast because we felt you know there's um, a loss of connection between the fans amongst themselves. Do you know what I mean? And the, when, you, when you go to the games, there's so many people from all around the globe. So, you know, it makes Manchester United that special club because of that reason. I think there's even a, a report that recently I've seen as well that in the US, Manchester United are still the most popular club. Um, you know, again, there's a, we're not winning. So it's not because of trophies or anything of that nature. Do you know what I mean? It, it's because of our diverse history. You know, uh, uh, and and the names we've, we've had the likes of Abu Saad who come on to the shows, or who you know spoken about, you know his love for the club and his background. Yusuf as well, brother from you know the Middle East. Um, you know, we've obviously people from South Africa. You know, I think even bringing in somebody like Sheikh Yassim, he'll bring another aspect of what us fans want, not just the fans who go to the game, because believe you me. He he will put uh, on a show. You know we we we've seen, you know what the Qatar World Cup did. You know there's no way that you put on a World Cup like that and you're living in that country and it's a small country anyway that you don't bring people's skill sets to this club and build that same community because from whoever you speak to went to the game, even the journalists, even the journalists who wanted to write Qatar off said they had a great time in, in, in Qatar. There's nothing that they could say, you know, and the stadiums are brilliant and, you know, it's known as the best World Cup, not only because of the things on the pitch, but obviously off the pitch as well. You know, they bring that expertise, that know-how to the club as well. I can see those parallels with John Henry Davis just, just turn it upside down, like we said, you know, putting lifts in the stadium, John Henry David did, you know, bars and gymnasium. Yes, we may have that kind of thing, but... You know, this this quote that they have, um, what was it now? The never ignored one, I forgot what it started. The Manchester United hated, adored, never ignored. Hate, yeah, so hated, adored, never ignored. That's going to go on another level. That's going to literally go on another level now because even now, we have it right now, but the moment Shea Jackson comes in, it's going to literally just flip upside down and just rise up a thousand times more. And we, we, everyone's going to see it. Yeah, and I, and I think for us, we, we get so excited because of obviously what's going to happen to our club. Do you know what I mean? I say this as, as the most humblest way, but we deserve so much better than what we're getting at the moment in time. Do you know what I mean? And so this guy ticks off the boxes for me, you know, he's a Manchester United fan. Yes, you know, the one negative, I suppose, we can say that he hasn't got the sporting pedigree, um, you know, between him and his dad's investments. I've not seen many sporting stuff there. So, look, you know, that, that that's a fair comment to say, and I think we can only judge it uh, as we'll go and, and what we see. But what we are confident about is what they'll bring to the surrounding areas, their, their business acumen. Um, their drive to win, you know, because that's one thing as well. And, you know, all, yes, Sheikh Jassim himself is a private character. Not many people know about him. That's another thing which is granted. But this... Would you say that, perhaps, would you say him being a private individual is a negative thing? That people don't know much about him, they know what? I, I don't think it's... Uh, I think it's a negative for others because of what the Glazers have done. Because... We've not heard from them and we wanted to hear from them, you, you know, and, and I think that's probably one of the things that annoys people and they probably want to know more about him to see who he is, which is fair enough, which is a fair comment because, you know, we don't, we don't, like I said, we don't, he's not as easy as accessible to see what his background is and the successes he's given, you know, he, his business success. But this is what I was going to say, his dad, HBJ, if you say he's, if you say Shay Jassim's private, HBJ I mean, been Java. Is is anything but you know, yeah. and he's part of this, and he's going to be part of this. And you know, we, we've talked about in the past. You know, he's the ex prime minister of Qatar. You know, you would have been to his hotels, his stores. If you've been to Harrods, that's theirs. You know what I mean? No, they stopped at. Uh, you know, when you visited London, you the Shard Everyone and all these other things. The shard, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. So you know, you would have already experienced what he does. Um, you know, he's friends in high places, as they, as they call it. 
So there's so much of that intelligence that, yes, you, you can say he hasn't had the experience in sports, but then everybody starts from somewhere. Like you said, the City Group, they didn't have any excellence in, in, in sports. Do you know what I mean? And you know how, do you know what I mean? PIF, Saudi, yes, they've done some sports, but not a football club, I'd say, as much. So, you know, they bring that across. You know, so there's so much just to, if I compare it to John Henry Davies, is it excites me. Do you know what I mean? Uh, of, of what's going to happen. But what I'll also say as well, sorry, before you know, we wrap up and, you know, close the show, by no means, if Shay Jesse comes in tomorrow, I, I'm not, I don't know if anybody else, we're not going to, by next week and the week after, become this ultimate team where we're just going to clear everybody in front of us. Because, ultimately, the manager might not be good enough. Ultimately, the likes of Rashford, Bruno, might not be good enough. You know, but the thing is, the reason why we can't point fingers at any individuals at the present moment because the whole club's rotten, and I, I just don't know where you start pointing the fingers with. Yeah, I think what it is with the club itself. Once the new ownership come in, people do think that it'll be obviously a quick thing where it's a turnaround. It, it's probably going to take at least about five, six windows to get the whole thing sorted. Do you know what I mean? Um, and to be honest with you, I would rather be in that position than just have a new manager come in or Ten Hag basically continuing his job as a manager and continue to fail and fail and fail. Do you know what I mean? I, I would rather have a football structure there um, and everything else basically just slowly, slowly just going upwards and onwards. That's it. It's, it's a gradual thing. It's not going to be... I don't know, Qatar buy us tomorrow and next week we win 7-0 and then we win 5 and it Like, no, it's not going to be that because there are so many issues at this football club that need ironing out. So you've kind of... I mean, we've said it before, right? Whoever takes over needs to come in and they need to hit reset. They need to go every single department okay if you're not a specialist get out the door if you're not the best in your field get out the door we want the best we want the most forward thinking most innovative people in every single one of our departments we want to be one step ahead because we're manchester united we want to be back at the top now that again that's not an overnight process because it's going to take time to find those right people but you know, you've got to start from somewhere. The foundations and, you know, the building blocks have got to be put in place. Yeah, and I, to me as well, like it says, um, I just want to, I, I, I want just to get a new set of owners, man. Do you know what I mean? In terms of somebody that we, uh, as what we say, the underrepresented, we can also relate to, do you know what I mean? Let, let, listen to our thoughts on the kind of things that, you know, that we want. Do you know what I mean? Um, as part of this great club, you know what I mean? It, it, you know, we a lot of like says Asian background people from the Middle East make Manchester, and you know, I, I think it'd be great to 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 have that uh, at the club. You know, I want some this each other on this in you know I mean? half time, some volley you know what I mean, give me some barfi as well. Like, you know I mean? forget like just the 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 Cabri's dairy milk. I want some, you want the you know, some you of that. I oh, have some Bronte one. Come on. Get, get, get early to the yeah. game, do you know what I mean? Um, get, get some Bronte with thee. Do you know what I mean? Put all that gear on there, Aki. Do you, you know what I mean? This is to go to a game early. <laughs> yeah, but no, but Look at the Bronte there, that like, you might be like, do you know what I mean? They might come. This is the thing, though. We can bring back the, uh, the the breakfast club if the games are like literally half to our kickoff. Maybe yeah, man. Kickoff. You know I mean, come on. Two hours early with the players. They come in at four hours early anyway. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But like I said, there's so, you know, I know, I know we will talk about it a later date a bit more, but, you know, I, I just want us to be selfish in that respect because I think we, 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 we are allowed to be selfish and say, look, man, as underrepresented fans, you know, we, we want that kind of diversity to be brought in because, like I said, the Manchester United name and what the club stands on is not just what's in Manchester, by Manchester. It's the worldwide community that we have. 
I think what it is for me, not, not for me, but I, I think from one of the perspective, I think the club deserves Sheikh Jassim in that sense, and it it actually deserves the Middle East as well. I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying it from a sporting sport washing kind of thing or whatever, but the club needs the Middle East. Um, it needs a diversity because UK it, needs the Middle East. So they 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 be having the yeah. Middle East for how long? Because we've literally had. Martin Edwards, um, we've had this Davis guy, we've had the Americans, you know what I mean? We're not going to have a Russian or a Chinese guy come in. The next big thing is literally the Middle East. Like, just just give it us, you know what I mean? Yeah, and just to piggyback on something you both said, it's not just about Manchester. Any, like, when John Henry Davis took over, it was Manchester, it was the surrounding area, it was probably that little bit of land. This is now worldwide. We are united across the world. We are united across continents. And the one constant in that is this football club. So, yeah, like, look, we should welcome the diversity because that's our whole fan base is diverse. And if you're talking about putting, you know, no disrespect to Sir Jim Ratcliffe, putting the Manchester back in Manchester, in my eyes, I think it is the whole thing of, Look, I work in the city centre. I walk through the city centre. There's Man City badges everywhere. There's Man City billboards everywhere. They're on every lamppost, every, you know, they have made it so their presence is known. They've marked their territory, essentially, right? So, yeah, there is a bit of that to it. But also, embrace the surrounding areas, man. Like, you've got Wimslow Road and things like that. Like, embrace these different cultures within that area. And yeah. you know, bring that to the club. Bring you know, bring different foods on match days, and you know, everyone loves a good curry, man. <laughs> You're telling me people won't say no to a curry at a game, for, yeah, for, I mean, well, a reasonable price. Do you know what I mean? It, you'll have a laugh. Yeah, like I said, you, there's there's so much of Manchester that's not in the club, uh, as crazy as it as it sounds. But you know, before we do kind of wrap up, I know you you kind of mentioned City there. Boys, I think we just shared some news there that the referees, I think there's a from the Mail Online, revealed demoted officials Darren England and Dan Cook were part of a refereeing team in the UAE just two days before significant VAR error during Tottenham's win over Liverpool as PGML faced scrutiny for allowing Pair to undertake 16 hour round trip. Is that another well, charge to see his uh, charge? <laughs> Does that make it 117 now? Um, yeah. Can I just I ask mean, one question about all these charges? Of course. So obviously City have been charged with everything. It's also well known about Barcelona being charged with everything, right? The structure at them clubs at the time was Chiki Bajiristain and Pep Guardiola. No doubt in Pep is a fantastic tactician. He's a great coach. If either of these two clubs are found guilty, does that tarnish his legacy? For me, look, I think the guy is a trendsetter. So irrespective of all the resources you get, you know, and even the likes of Jose Mourinho got, you know, resources both at Chelsea as well, you know, he, the brain himself, he, he, he's good. I can't deny him, deny what he's done. Do you know what I mean? However, when you're going to compare, I think he's had a obviously um, advantage over other managers in the league because, like I said, with these charges and you know, through these, um, f- um, you know, the fraud around the way they've you know financed the operation, then yeah, he's had an um, unfair advantage. You know, the, the guys himself, he's obviously a great manager, let's not doubt, but he's had fair on advantage on top of that. Yeah, what it is, though, uh, Pep Guardiola, he's, he's got the same setup at City, what he had at Barcelona. When he was at Munich, he didn't have that setup, really, did, did mm-hmm. he? No. Um, so he was, he is basically a really good manager, quality manager, but if I have to pick between two managers, Mourinho and Guardiola, because I, that's what they compare both managers. I would pick Mourinho 
but I think it would tarnish his legacy in terms of Barcelona, he had that set up, and then City, he has got that set up now. Um, I mean, for, for me, it's one of those things where I think City had to do it to bring the re- revenue in. Um, I'm not too sure if he knew about it. Obviously, behind closed doors, whatever happens, it happens. Uh, but he must have known something was happening. Do you know what I mean? If that same setup is happening at Barcelona as well as well as City, so I well the Barcelona thing is obviously the ref bribe. Right, yeah, yeah. The HQ got uh, raided the other day, and obviously it's it. You know, look if these charges stick and they are found guilty, Barcelona are not going to be able to pay any fines because they're broke. Even at the same time, I think uh, when he was a player at Brescia, was he he failed a drug test? Drug test, didn't it? I think he yeah, failed yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like I said, he, the guy himself, obviously, you, you got to give him props. You know what I mean? Um, but he's had so much going for him, and like you said, he, he's you have to take his history into into account. You know, clearly, he tries to take every ounce of advantage you can get with these power drug tests. Um, you know, it's obviously part of his makeup. Um, yeah. Um, There's also a little theory around uh, City's injuries. Yeah, the, 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 the guy from Spain, out. the doctor. Yeah, they all go to the same doctor, and it's just a bit strange that, that no one else has thought, oh, let's use him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, there's so many question marks. But look, I think if we ended up on a, on a note for Manchester United, I think. I mean, you have to tell them the last couple of podcasts we had done we was quite positive. We just come back up the wins. You know, this one kind of started well, actually. The the ladies have won. Now we've got Galatasaray on Tuesday. What do you think? I can see Aki already laughing, man. You know, you know <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we probably end up getting a win against Galatasaray. You know, I think it'll be a one 0 win. Um, I think Ten Hag will end up having. The hair dryer treatment with the players. Um, one thing I've, one thing I thought about was last season when we lost to Brentford. The next day he did that kind of um, training session, the hardcore one. I'm surprised he's not, he's not doing it again. But obviously, again, we don't know because wasn't that during a heat meeting. wave as well? Go on. That that um, Brentford thing you're referencing the next day wasn't that during the heat wave as well? Yeah, I think so. I think but I think that time, and I think they outran us. I don't think um, Palace outran us. Um, do you know what I mean? No, I, I think, think that's what his point was. That obviously yeah, yeah. yeah. We but I think we we will end up we will end up winning on Tuesday one nil, um, and hopefully we can build on that. Hopefully we can build on that. But I I do expect him to make changes. I do want to see Ganacho and Hannibal play and Martial. Um, either one of them can start. See, see, sorry, Maki, just to even mention the guy's name, Martial, playing exactly after I was shaking his head. Yeah, yeah. It's got so bad that we even know. I don't think you're alone by saying it, Aki, by no means, but you know, it's got so bad that even we know calling for Martial, man. Yeah, but I know, but think is so, you know, the, he, he, when he came on a few games, whatever, he played good. So I, I I actually want to see agreed him. agreed yeah, yeah. Agreed. so I I actually want to see him start a game but even then if he even if he's on the bench give him at least thirty minutes uh, same with the Ganacho if he was going to start the game or if he's going to come off the bench give him thirty minutes don't leave it until like five minutes left or whatever I think Hannibal needs to start a game I think he needs to start again uh, the Champions League. But then again, I he feel like not... that Galatasaray game is perfect for him starting. Yeah, yeah. Like the the intensity would be the right even then Galatasaray, they are passionate team as well. The fans are passionate, so I think it would mean a lot for Hannibal to start. But for me, Rashford needs to knuckle down, needs to knuckle down, and I hope this game does. Look, I like I said to you. That... At the start, I agree with everything you said there, and I would like to get Rashford to come out because, like I said, for me, Rashford isn't alone. If you're going to talk about Rashford, you've got to talk about Bruno. Um, you know, you've got to talk about the other players who who also haven't done as great as well. So, unfortunately, Rashford, you know, will get the brunt of it. Brunt of it there. 
Um, but before we wrap up, any any anything else? No, I was just going to say I think Zaha's going to turn into Prime Messi but on Tuesday night. Well, I think he scored on the weekend, didn't he? Oh, he scored on the weekend. Goal. Yeah. Um, the only thing I, I want to mention uh, on Marcus Rashford is, you know, last season, we didn't have a number nine. He was the main striker. I think that's one of the reasons why he had everything on his head and he had to deliver. Do you know what I mean? Now, I get that he had to deliver last season because he scored, obviously, a lot of goals and everything. I think this season is different because he now he knows he's got hard in the front. Even though he wants to be the main person, he's not that main person to score all the goals, if that makes sense. So I think maybe his mind's a bit different from last season to, to now. I'll be honest with you, I literally can't put my finger to it because, like yeah. I said, uh, all I know is he's not performing and obviously he'll be the first one to say that as well. He's not mm. performing and like I said, they, they just if we go by for yesterday's game, just the whole team isn't performing, but they performed on Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you can't be so bad from one game to another. And this is what I said. It just leads me to just think, think things behind the scenes are not as great as they should be. But look, I'm, you know, let's let's wrap it up here. Um, you know, and and I think just I just had a, a pop up from the Athletic, um, and you know, I think it's a perfect way to kind of end it. I think it was an article from um, Oliver Kay. You know, and the art, um, the headline reads: Manchester United's many problems. Sancho Stadium sale and struggles over its soul and i think that's what it is we just have no soul or identity as a club no more man i think it's just mix and match and that's why we are where we are today but everybody again thank you um for listening to another episode as always please you know um, interact with us we always enjoy and thank you for the feedback that you do give us and um, hopefully we're back with a run from galatasaray